guys, if you join me on stage and have a seat. Good morning, everyone. So, it's time to get to the heart of the matter. You know, let's talk about sharing power and capital. So, maybe as an introduction, I, I would like to tell you why, uh, why we have this discussion right now. It's part of a track called uh, Building a True Sharing Economy. So, uh, I get the assumption is what we have now, the kind of sharing economy we have now, did not really live up to our expe expectations. It's, um, there's something imperfect to it. So, as you, as you may have heard, all the discussions we had yesterday, it was, I mean, sharing power and capital is kind of, yeah, the, it's a big dragon, you know, in the house. Because, well, it's quite clear that the sharing economy generates value through user interactions. But it does not really uh, give more decision-making power to people. And people do not become shareholders of these platforms. So these are kind of hybrids, uh, hybrids organizations. So, and why do we have David Dugarte, Juho Makonen, and Matt and Phil on stage here? I think, I think it's interesting because these guys, to me, are kind of building the blocks of what could be a true sharing economy if it converge eventually. So, let me introduce you guys very briefly. So, David Dugarte, it's good to have you here again. You were here last year, and uh, I'm always happy to see you. So, you were one of the co-founders of uh, Las Indias, which is a group of cooperatives. A very, the way I see you, you guys are pioneers of distributed organizations with feelers. Maybe you will tell a little bit about that, this concept. And I feel like, you know, you are the guys who kind of build the intellectual framework for, for what's happening right now. You know, we have heard a lot about blockchain these days. And you were talking about this kind of organization long before the concept of blockchain ever existed. Juho Makonen, so you are a WeShare connector in Finland. And you're also the co-founder of ShareTribe, which is yep. a WordPress for marketplace. So you're empowering, lowering the barrier to entrepreneurship. And Matan, we, we saw you yesterday already. Uh, you are you were one of the co-founders of Lazoos, and you're involved in a new venture called Backfeed, if I'm right. You will tell us about that. And you also happen to be a theoretical physicist. You have a PhD in string theory. Maybe we'll get back to that after. And uh, but given the, I, I, you know, I counted. I saw that uh, during the um, yesterday, about 80% of the talks and keynotes and uh, panel discussions, uh, at some point the word blockchain popped up. So uh, I wanted to know how, how does it feel to be the coolest kid on, on the playground right now? <laughs> okay, so that's, that's a hard question. <laughs> All right, <laughs> it's a joke. <laughs> well, I guess, I guess the, um, the, the, there is a sense of revolution that uh, you feel when, when there is a lot of resonance. Uh, when, you, when you do something and then you feel that this something resonates in many places. So and you know, because it almost sounds like some kind of magic wand. So it's uh, either it's a magic wand, maybe, or maybe you need to have a PhD in string theory to understand how it works. <laughs> That's a well, there is there's a distinction between understanding how it works or what it does. Like, I don't understand how my car works, but I know what it does, and that suffices for me. Interesting so I think point. understanding what it does, it's not that difficult. Okay, interesting. But we'll get back to that. Well, maybe my first question, and for this one, you know, it's uh, it's really a general question, and I want to hear all three of you about that. I want to share uh, as my first question um, that I'm puzzled, you know, because sharing power and capital, I, it almost feels like power and capital are the same thing. So why? I mean, why is it some kind of, you know, sense of suffrage? It's been, you know, we used to vote like that. Why is it the more you own the more you get to decide. We, do, we would not accept that in a political system anymore. 150 years ago, maybe, but not anymore. Why is it that capital and power are so heavily related, so deeply related to each other? Maybe David, to, to begin with. Yeah, uh, originally, you know, uh, capital, as we understand it, uh, as money, you know, uh, was a most vali valuable resource. So, it seemed to be natural that in order to develop the productivity of an economy, to build up the railways, to create the telegraph system, so you need a big firm 
with a lot of capital who allows you to make a big investment, paying a lot of wages in order to create a big infrastructure. Yes. Business were capital intensive. Yes, this were the 19th century, and capital, uh, capital in those days meant, you know, to accelerate the ability of society for, uh, for, for, for growing, and in Europe for uh, making poorness disappear. But the system who was created from this point, capitalism, is not about capital. Or uh, There was an old theoretician called Karl Marx who said to us that capital was not money, but was a social relation. Absolutely. And that's, that's the real point. Social relations are related to the communication structure of a society. You know, in the old world, in the really old world, in the example, in the, in the France of the 18th century, or the France in the 19th revolution uh, is, is, is daughter of, uh, uh, the structure of communication was La Poste. And La Poste is, was a really, really centralized structure. If you see uh, the, the maps of La Poste in uh, 1701, you can see what a real centralized country is. The interesting thing is, you can change politics, yeah, That's but you point. don't change that, and you have centralism and capital again, and it is what happened with the Jacobins. That's interesting, because historically in France, the post office was born with the French Revolution, and Jacobinism, it's, that's what really kicked things yes. in. You who you, you wanted yes. to read all this sorry, also. Yeah, uh, uh, the thing. Then we have Telegraph, and the France of the Telegraph is a decentralized France. It's the France of the provinces. It's the France of the national parties by first time, because Le Club uh, Jacobin était uh, Parisien. And now we have a distributed structure, and able to be distributed structure, that is the real base of internet, fighting against centralized uh, structures of uh, startups. And I'm sure that it yeah. echoes a lot with what you do, you know, because you have a platform empowering people to build their own platforms. So what can you tell us about this very first question? Yeah, exactly. I think somebody in yesterday in the panel said something about that the platforms of these days are like asset light in the sense that they don't need that much capital to actually kind of build the technology. But then the capital in them is come kind of comes from the network effect. Like if you think about the mainstream sharing economy platforms today, they all have this huge network and, and, and they have been, the, the ca they have uh, used that capital to kind of like build that network and so that they kind of make themselves known in many senses and, and, uh, and obviously the technology that they built and the kind of money that they used to build that technology has been part of like, uh, kind of like building that network effect. So kind of what we are trying to change is to make the technology part really affordable and accessible. So basically that anybody could have access uh, to the technology that you can use to actually build your own uh, own marketplace site, like own Airbnb for X or Etsy for Y, like without that actually having to spend lots of money, without actually knowing even anything about technology. So we kind of like created this uh, WordPress for sharing economy in the sense it's an open source platform that anybody can use to create their own site. And, and that's why we are kind of like seeing, hope to see the future that instead of like having only these uh, kind of uh, big platforms that have this huge network effect, we could have like lo lots of our big network of local marketplaces and, and local players that are kind of like sharing uh, the capital and power. So I think that um, this question of why, why, um, why capital leads to power, I really think the question is not why, but how we counteract uh, against it. So why? So just to answer why, I think it's just a natural tendency. I mean, to say that I have capital means that I have something which is which has scarcity, and since there is scarcity for that, it means that I have and someone doesn't have, and that by that by definition I have power because someone else wants it. So c capital leads to power per se, and the question is well, first question is what why is why is wrong. Because it's, it, um, basically it, it leads to counteracting on another good thing, which is creating a network effect or sharing. 
And I think the question is not why is that like that, but the question is how do we um, enhance the, the incentive for coming together, for working together, for, gen for generating this network effect and counteracting on the natural tendency of capital turning into uh, power. Would you say it's I, the, or I, sorry, how, ahead, how do we enhance the power of the network as uh, well? Okay. I, I guess I disagree. You know, I like I having people disagreeing on panels. <laughs> That's when you, you really have a tense discussion. Go ahead, David. I think we, we don't need capital in that sense. We don't need to be like Google. You know, its power comes from the ability of centralizing. If we don't centralize, if we federate, if we distribute, we don't need, we don't need capital. So I don't, I don't, uh, I don't want capital. You know, you there's think that no capital is natural, na naturally the, occurring in a way. That's the capital I need is for free. That is free software, you know, it's for free. Then, an example, you are working but, but with... But then I, I will not call it capital. I mean, th that's, that's, that's true, something but different. But I will not okay. call it capital. Capital is something that I, I want to have, but I cannot have as much as I want. It's because there is would it make sense? For, for instance, Yuho Share Tribe is an open source platform, right? Yeah, no. so exactly. Uh, would, it, would it have any sense to talk about something like open source capital or I mean capital yeah. is closed per se yeah. no yeah. so yeah. that's I, I get that's yeah. the discussion we have yeah, right I, I now. kind of I feel that the kind of why why these platforms have needed the capital is to kind of build the kind of the building blocks they have needed to build the process to build the how how is this kind of network effect created they have needed it to build the technology they have needed it to build the awareness kind of the whole structure but if somebody builds the building blocks like we all are doing here now building the processes and go how to how the governance is handled, how the pro uh, profit sharing is handled, how the technology is handled. If those exist, then lots of small uh, network players can leverage that and they don't have to have the capital to use that, just like David said. What, what is the problem with centralized organizations? Because we are talking about networks versus centralized organizations. So in a way, platforms are centralized organizations like any other traditional corporation. What's the, what, what is the issue? Yeah, what's the problem? So, so I think I, I think we are missing a word here. So let let's just put another word in yeah. on the put table, on the, on the table, which is social capital. So let's just call, call it social capital. I think maybe if Ronald here is is one of the promoter of this word, and maybe you are talking about social capital, which is a capital which is owned by a network. It's not this capital or something. You know, it's not money or it's not uh, food. It's something that the whole network holds. And the, if you want the problem with centralization that it promotes capital, but discourages social capital. But well, decentralization just does the... Yeah, and no, and but, and but have a look to, you know, we are working now in, in creating a, 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 a new social federated network of suburbs. Talk to uh, me. Of suburbs, you know. In order to create this sharing economy for free with people sharing all around. We don't need this money capital, because everybody in every suburb ca has a free suburb, that is a capital in the se traditional sense, and it's for free. So what we think, and then they federate, so it's, it's so distributed that the uh, marginal cost is zero, so you, you don't have to, to make a, an invest there. So it's a, it's a real traditional capital that now is for free. We are in the transition towards a uh, capitalism without capitalist towards a society of capital without capitalism. You, you wanted to react uh, on this? Or? Yeah, so I uh, kind of feel so to the original question, like kind of what is the problem with having the centralized organizations? So I guess, guess it's related to what Chermayev said yesterday that uh, sharing economy is owned by the 1%. Is there somebody in the audience who thinks that that is a good thing? <laughs> no, but that's true. That, that, you know, that when, I was sitting, when I was sitting uh, on the yeah. bench of a business yeah. school, I was told that the, the goal of a company, the ultimate goal is to maximize shareholders' value. Yeah. So I guess exactly. the big problem is yeah, once you have a yeah. centralized organization, yeah. you always end up to extracting value for a small elite. Exactly, so. and that's kind of because the, the, that's the biggest problem in, in the world like right now. We are creating so much value, but how is that value distributed equally to everybody? And that we have to solve somehow. And I think that decentralization is the best way to solve that. But why is it that so far, le let's be a bit provocative, but let's be honest, so far, it seems like centralized platforms are well ahead in the race. 
Why, why is that? Why do you think, you know, because you are helping people build building platforms. Uh, how do you compete with these? Uh, are they better? Uh, if networks effects create so much efficiency, why aren't we, why, why aren't we winning so far? Maybe yeah. you yeah. and uh, Matt and yeah. 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 So, so uh. decentralization has a, has a lot of power in terms of diversity um, and, and dense, dense in the network. But the, the real problem of decentralization is syncing many, many individual nodes in the network. And I think so far, uh, the reason why centralized platforms are uh, overcoming decentralized platforms is because we're, we simply haven't learned to sync, synchronize uh, in, a, in an efficient way. I, I see your point, you know, because it's a bit of a joke, but wh when you sent me your biography, uh, you were saying that you were a theoretical physicist, sometimes working I with 11 dimensions. So my question would be, what is the most difficult thing to do? Is it to think about 11 di dimensions or get a, a group of people to to work together without central authority. What is the most difficult thing from a conceptual point of view? Getting people yeah. to work together or working in theoretical physics? Yeah, getting people to work together is much <laughs> harder than uh, string theory, actually. That's what I thought. Well, <laughs> we well, have work to do then. <laughs> you who maybe? Yeah, well, I have uh, to uh, say yeah. one thing, just a little advertisement. Sure. Go ahead. That today, I didn't have a chance to say it before with Juan, but today in Amazon, we have published in English uh, the book of community. That You're is publishing a book today? Yeah, in English. You too? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's our community experience uh, of a traditional Icarian Fourierist uh, commune for 15 years. So it's a quite intimate book, you know, sharing that. And, I and it's available on Amazon today, people. You, you, you got the notice. Yeah, <laughs> if you look for community in Amazon Kindle, you will find it. And I want to say but it's you, you're not publishing so that on a very centralized platform. I'm joking, yes. you know. No, 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 it's true. It's true. We did it in the Spanish version, it's for free, and it's EPUB and is public domain. You know, because uh, is we are publishing a book today also, and when I put the link to Amazon, my publisher told me, no, don't do that, Yeah, please. I hate <laughs> Amazon because it's a very centralized thing, but, well, you know, the American translators use it, so. You who? Yeah. In, maybe yeah. maybe you wanted to react on this? Yeah, yeah, I think that kind of like, well, as we're talking about the transition here, uh, I think it's kind of like the, now the centralized platforms are succeeding because that's what we know and that's what we have kind of known for a long time. So it's kind of the model. And it's ap simply applying the old model to kind of uh, to kind of this new economy, and obviously that's what people know, and that's what, what was the obvious kind of first choice. And in the way they have kind of like been leaning the way in many things, that money has been used to, for instance, to change the regulation, and kind of like so these big players have been able to <laughs> hire lots of lawyers and and I'll kind of like so talk to the governments and kind of mainstream. We'll get back to that, that because I have a question yeah. about the legal yeah. frameworks and do yeah. we do we do we exactly. have the the frameworks we need to build a new kind of regulation? I, that quickly. I also have to disagree with that. Oh. You know, you're disagreeing a lot with people I, I, today. I disagree That's good. a lot. Today. You've changed, you know. Yeah. Maybe it was at breakfast, <laughs> and <laughs> you know, I think, uh, well, you are losing part of the picture. Uh, the distributed real social network out there that doesn't need to use internet. Sharing is all around every day. We, we have making studies in suburbs in Bilbao, and how people share and shares home, and if you project this data, you know, Airbnb is a small business compared with free home sharing. You know, f free economy, abundance economy, is so big and so invisible that we only make the comparison between the... the so you think you, we're, we're missing a point, I get you. Yeah. So. Matt. so one, one problem to get to a decentralized uh, network is that we are, in, in fact, in every part of our life, we're stuck in uh, what's called in mathematics Nash equilibrium, uh, Nash equilibrium of, uh, uh, of non-cooperativeness. So what's, what's a Nash equilibrium? What, what does it mean? It just means that all of us in are in a position that if, you, if just one is changing his position, is changing his strategy, He's just losing. It's a prisoner's dilemma. It's exactly, a game the prisoner, exactly, the prisoner's yeah. dilemma. So we are all stuck in all parts of life in, an, in a national equilibrium of non-cooperativeness. Now, there, there is, it does exist 
another national equilibrium of, of cooperativeness, maybe of maybe uh, related to the abundance economy. We, we will have the a panel discussion this afternoon about this question. Why do we cooperate? Is it a question of human right. nature or you know design of organizations? But, but, the, but, the, real, the, but the real the real challenge is how to jump from one equilibrium to another equilibrium. That's exactly related to the, right. the, the scheme of decentralized application. The blockchain, because let's talk a bit about the blockchain, because I think you're, you're one of the person who can define it quite easily. Uh, does it increase this efficiency? Is it the technology we need to increase efficiency and compete with the big platforms? And does it, does it authorize you, does it enable you to, to overcome this problem of non-cooperativeness? Non I mean, so, so blockchain is half of the picture. It does give you the technological structure to break through, but it doesn't give you the, the I would say, game strategy to do that. And, and the game strategy to do that is to incentivize early adopters to incentivize those early birds who jump from the Nash equilibrium and try to cooperate, although there is not yet a benefit, and give them early potential benefit that later uh, is, so, so to say, redeemable for real value. So it's about finding the right incentives, right? Yeah, right. You it's just, that. just finding the right incentivization force. And what do you and call a DCO? A because I, I saw yes. the, you, you yeah. sent me about DCO. What can you, what is a DCO? So DCO is this decentralized collaborative organization, which basically means that you have millions or, you know, indefinite number of people who are all free actors. And simply you generate a, I would say, game strategy or scheme or rules that uh, incentivize cooperation. So whenever a free agent, a free player, is acting in a way which is aligned with the network around him, is getting value from that network. And just that incentivization mechanism itself create a tendency to, for people to align uh, their action together. Yeah. And I think that kind of the incentives are like kind of obvious. Like if you think about Uber, and like lots of discussions here are mentioned, like if there would be like Uber owned by the drivers, uh, then instant, obviously for every driver, that would bring so much incentive. Hey, I actually own part of this whole piece. I have some say in how this platform develops. It cannot screw me over. I have some rights. My rights are protected somehow. So that's a, if we can build this kind of systems and they can like ha have the technology and they ha can have the process so it's not too difficult for them to kind of form these kind of organizations, then definitely the in incentive is there. And then for the consumer side, it's also the incentive. Obviously, these kind of organizations, because not, none of the profit is going to venture capitalists. So it means that it's for consumer, it's going to mean lower prices. It's going to mean also better quality because these people enjoy their work more. That's, you know, I, I will have a question about funding, about the funding conundrum uh, for, yeah, for I, you guys I, after. But first, a question for you. I have a question for you, David. I, I, I disagree <laughs> Go ahead. again. Oh, God. <laughs> Come on. I'm the, I'm the bad guy today. And well, I think that what you say, Mark, and I, I, I think your mistake, both of you, is that you're thinking platforms as games, but the main evolutionary game, as we spoke before, is out there in the street. And is what, sorry? Is out there in the street. Yeah. The real, uh, share, uh, the real sharing game, the real sharing economy is happening in, the, in, in society and it's an evolutionary game inside community. And when I say community, I mean real communities, not a free open platform, but these clusters of people relating each other. And this new stage, this collaborative Nash equilibrium you talk about already exists and is ruled by one thing we used to call culture, Th especially in Latin countries. I, I, I'm sure and you're a big fan of Carl Polanyi because what I hear here is actually you are talking about the fact that for about due to economics, you know, we are influenced by economics, and we started believing that uh, market exchanges that uh, were different from normal social relations. So I guess I feel like and, you know and, it's what and, really and the, the discussion we are having here. I, I, and at the end of the day, what I think is that sharing economy and sharing uh, software, what you have to do, uh, what we have to do, what we are trying to do, is to be a liar over the real existing sharing economy yeah, not in the street against and these. not to put another uh, set of rules trying to uh, mm,
to change a real sharing culture that is overwhelmingly yeah, that's uh, an interesting bigger point. than the yeah. online yeah. Uh, sharing economy. And the whole, obviously the whole sharing economy thing, as we well know, is really misleading here, because like in the collaborative economy, we are really t talking about how goods and services in general are produced, how they are consumed. So we're not only talking about things that are kind of like shared for free, but also just for kind of like professional services for new goods that are produced to 3D printing by makers. So basically anything that is uh, kind of that people are using money uh, to buy uh, these days. And we are also need to think like how this economy, which definitely not is cannot be called as a sharing economy, how, how that can be distributed and how those producers uh, can also, That's also be part of that. That's a market. Yeah, but so the question is, market is regulated. We have legal frameworks yeah. which were tailored for another age. So, and I feel somehow there is a, there is some kind of inertia to the corporate structure. And I remember, Matt, and when we talked for the first time a few months ago, we, we had a discussion about legal struct structures. I mean, what, do we really have, you know, the kind of legal frameworks that we need to build su such organizations? I mean, how would it, would it work? Yeah, so actually this is a fascinating question which are, uh, a lot of experts are working on. Um, and and it, it is actually one of the challenges, one of the big challenges in this industry. But my feeling is that actually we are, um, so the, the, let's say the entrepreneurs are like 100 years before the regulators. Like they are, so take for example Bitcoin. I mean Bitcoin, no one, no one understood it like until recently. And then you have facts you just you just make facts, and now regulators are working with the entrepreneurs to understand what Bitcoin is and how to reg regul regulate it correctly. So in that, in some sense, we are actually creating reality, and then uh, I would say communicating with the regulators to find the, the right structure, the legal structure, to wrap it in a way that, on one hand, I mean, none of us is trying to avoid taxes or avoid anything no, of, the, of the of the country. And on the other hand, not not uh, I would say, um, not not uh, still letting letting this kind of uh, advancement and technology grow. Uh, so it's 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 a song and dance between the uh, the entrepreneurship uh, world and the and the legal world. Yeah, and obviously, at least we have lots of like similar structures, like co-ops and more of the traditional structures. So some of that infrastructure is is there already. We just need to adapt. That it needs to, to be mod heavily modernized right. now because I saw David that you in your recent works you're you're quite thinking you're thinking a lot about le re legislations regulations, yeah, about GNU and some and things yeah, like that. Yeah, uh, uh, the, the the question is the ways the old economy recentralized have to always to do with rent they catch from the state in different uh, regulative uh, normative intellectual property is the most clear of it. You know, you create uh, time or local monopolies, uh, energy and electricity regulation. is the yeah. same. You are talking and about lobbyists. That's so what you they produce do, yeah. scarcity. Yes. Closing it. Yeah, there are, there are two ways today, two main ways to create the scarcity in society. The first, uh, or three, the first one is uh, legally through intellectual uh, property. The second one is infrastructure. The Technological, that's so what we The way yeah, Google the does with you, you know. And the third one? In order to justify. Maybe I have an idea about the uh, third one. Gigant, uh, gigant capitals. The problem of this society is that we have a huge amount of capital over there in the markets that cannot be profitable in the real economy. So they have to invent shit mm. in order to make it profitable. So they invent. Uh, intellectual property, they invent uh, startups, they invent recentralization in order to create, you know, a big uh, necessary investment for being competitive in the internet, making the things you can do for free. And the third way is inequality. So, because creating inequality, you know, through education, in, in example, you make people and a huge base of people dependent on capital owners. But the good thing is that market and capitalism already have created the conditions for destroy forever that without need of nothing more than to use the free capital we have and the social distributed network we do. That's an interesting point and which leads <laughs> us to, yeah, of course, but the third one especially. <laughs> Thank you, David. So I hear you, you know, 
le regulations enable people to lock them to lock their rents. And I remember Matten, in a way, I, I thought, you know, when we discussed the first time that, in a way, you, you were thinking that eventually you, you don't really need the law. Eventually, code is low. It, when the blockchain systems are set up, it will be just obsolete, in a way, no? Yeah, I think the understanding of what law is is changing and also understanding of what country and state will be changing. But in a way, so today, when we try to actually build a decentralized organization, uh, we still, the technology is not mature enough and we still need to um, kind of rely on the existing structure. So we actually worked for like for eight months with a, a law firm to, to, to formalize a legal structure that is consistent with what we are doing and, and it worked. Um, I think in the future, for example, if you take Bitcoin, the, techno the technological structure is in a way, it to some extent is beyond, well, it's not beyond, li li I mean, still the law can uh, refer to it, but it's not, it's, it's, it's in some sense it's beyond the, the existing structure. It, so, so a smart contract, so something that people talk about, a smart contract is something that, that executes itself in a way that no longer, um, no longer we have a control on it, over it. So in fact, uh, legal experts today are trying to, to reformalize uh, what they know about legal according to that kind of uh, technology. So it's, it's really a, a, a next step it's of evolution. It's a work in progress, right? Yeah. But the, my last question, I think, you know, that's, that's the big dragon, you know, hidden. If centralized on organizations enable people to extract value for, for the elite, for the 1%, and if decentralized organizations don't, how are you going to raise funds? You know, who is gonna, who's going to get, give you funds? Because you hope, for instance, you enable people to yeah. build their own platforms, yeah. so it's not, it's not centralized, but yeah. you are yourself a VC-funded platform. I mean, how did you get... Uh, a capitalist to you to hand you to hand you money if you did not uh, I mean you have to give them something back right yeah uh, definitely and like for instance like we our startup company we have a business model ourselves like because as many of the big companies we also realized it takes a lot of uh, a lot of money to develop the technology first time it takes years and years of of, of development work uh, but then our kind of key idea is that when the technology has been developed once then lots of other people can use it. And because we are making it commons, so we also have a business model. We offer it uh, as a hosted version, and we offer ser services on top of, the, top of the open source code. But the basic thing is commons, and nobody owns that, and, and nobody can uh, kind of control that in a way. Uh, so basically, all those small organizations, they don't necessarily need the capital, because when we have all the processes there, when the technology is there, they don't have to raise that much funds. They can just focus on the community, and they can operate on much kind of lower margins there. And, and Matten, with all the hype around the concept of blockchain, I mean, are investors receptive to what you guys are building? I mean, how, how does this interaction between the centralized old world and the decentralized world happen? How does it work? I mean, what kind of relations do you have with these people? Yeah, I completely agree. Actually, I think I think the right thing to do, to do is actually to to make the bridge between the the capitalistic world and the new world, and not try to fight between them. So indeed, we also made a business model in a way that makes both a, a fundraise a money from investors and and still uh, support the new world that we are anticipating. Um, so in a way, I think that's the right way to go. David, you want to add something on this, or you well, disagree? Uh, maybe uh, again. I don't know. Uh, I I don't know. I, the only thing I know is that we we in our community, we are living the last 15 years. We have never got out alone. We started with 3,000 euros. We just try to give the our environment some customers, put in some products as much ideas as we can. Juan Urruti asked us once, how can you live giving ideas for free? And well, I still don't know if this is a Matthew effect or not, but I, I can say you that uh, I have never, uh, we have never made a business plan or a capitalist. And we are 15 years old, that is a lot more than the great majority of the startups survive. Thank you, David. So, uh, yeah, let's give him. 
Okay, we have like two minutes left, and you know that this particular edition of WishFS is called Lost in Transition. So I guess that applies to company, that applies to startup, that applies to corporations. Now, I mean, the vast majority of uh, economic activity are handled through corporations, which are centralized organizations, or startups, but at the end of the day, it's kind of the same thing, right? How do you transition from this state to the decentralized state? What kind of tools do we have? Because it's not about doing an IPO, right? Could we invent something like a community buyout, you know, like a CBO, let's try and you know, pattern this. And wh what do you think? How do you move from A to B? Because that's the big question of which of us. Yeah, and at least to me, it definitely seems that the route is kind of the big organizations are kind of leading the way. Now we are starting to have the regulation in place. Now we start to have the basic processes in place, like how, do this, how does this new economy work? And now when we apply those models, when we have new models of governance, then just basically simply building the building blocks and then raising awareness through like events like this and what WeShare is doing, and basically kind of letting people know that they're actually an alternative way and it's easier for them and like making it really easy for them to kind of jump into this new bandwagon. Yeah, that's like, the message. Like there kind there kind are of, alternatives. Yeah, kind of like one city at a time, one co-op at a time. So Margaret Thatcher was wrong. That's good news. <laughs> right, come on, we have 20 seconds left, guys, if you want to be on, st uh, on schedule. So I want to hear you both on this also. Okay, just, just in one sense, I think we are, what, what we really need to do is to build the infrastructure that will let um, co com common people to come together and spontaneously and, and, and reach that point that you are referring to? Well, I, I think that capitalism is already moving people to do that. You can have a look to Greece or, or to Spain. You know, there are two layers. The first layer is what people is doing in order to survive. You can go to Latin America, they did for a long decades. You go to Portugal, Spain, Greece, you are looking the future of Europe. People is share or die. That's a point. Second, we are building uh, tools, very magnificent tools, you know, as blockchain, as... Uh, Share tribe. As, yeah, and, uh, or new social or, or any kind of free software. And people will make... The important thing is not we making the tools, but the people move by the economic movement of society, taking them, transforming them, and using them in order to, to improve uh, the way they live. And the only way to do that is sharing. And that would be your our last word. It's a good way to conclude. Thank you, David. Thank you, gentlemen. Great discussion. And we'll see you later. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.